Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar on the topic of Mind Over Brain, Addressing the Language and Cognitive Challenges of MS. My name is Ann Gilbert, and I'm the Programs Manager for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this evening. For those of you who are new to who we are and what we do, Can Do MS is a provider of lifestyle empowerment programs uh, for people with MS and for their support partners. Through our programs, such as these webinars, we empower people to manage their disease and to move beyond their MS so that they can live healthy and active daily lifestyles. You can learn about these programs um, on our website by going to www.mscando.org backslash programs. And we have our four-day can-do program that's done once a year. Um, and we also have our Jumpstart program, which is our one-day program that's done four to five times a year around the country. And we also have our two-and-a-half-day Take Charge program uh, that's done about twice a year. And then, of course, we have our webinar series. So you can learn about all of these programs and see if we'll be coming into your area by visiting our website. You can also search with us um, and connect with us on social media. We have a Facebook page, so please go to Facebook, find us, we can do multiple sclerosis, and like us on Facebook, and you'll be up to date on all sorts of information regarding our upcoming programs and events. We're also on Twitter, so connect with us on Twitter and receive the most up-to-date tweets about what's happening in our office or in our community. And we're also on YouTube. Uh, you can find archived webinars and some fun videos uh, on our YouTube link. So uh, please uh, search for us on social media. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters for this evening's webinar. On your screen here, you'll see Janet. Janet DeClark is a speech pathologist, um, and she has over 30 years of experience working with individuals with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, brain injury, and stroke in acute and post-acute inpatient rehab, skilled nursing, outpatient, and home health settings. She's also enjoyed working as a programs consultant for us for Can Do MS for the past 15 years. And after living 20 years in Edwards, Colorado, last year Janet and her husband moved to Shell Beach on California's Central Coast. Janet now works in acute inpatient rehab at Dignity Health Marion Medical Center in Santa Maria, California. Our next presenter is Julianne hansen Lottis. Julianne has been an occupational therapist for 23 years, 20 of which she has specialized in neurological rehabilitation. Throughout her career, she has sought positions with multidisciplinary healthcare teams, including MS Rehabilitation Clinic, Spasticity Clinic, Huntington's Disease Clinic, Epilepsy, and Brain Tumor Medical Teams. She has worked with the Rocky Mountain MS Center, teaching numerous classes and seminars regarding MS symptom management. It was a natural fit for Julianne to join Can Do MS as an OT consultant 10 years ago, and she loves the positive energy she provides, the programs provide. Julianne has specialized in outpatient therapy for 15 years, and she now owns her own clinic, Red Willow LLC, which is located in Castle Rock, Colorado. Her special interest is restoring quality of movement while maximizing independence and wellness in daily activities. So I now welcome both Janet and Julianne, um, and I welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you. Welcome to everybody. Uh, this is Janet DeClark. I am the speech pathologist half of this duo this evening, um, along with Julianne. And um, I'm going to assume that you've joined us because you're interested in this topic of cognition that we're going to be discussing this evening. Um, and as you can see from this little cartoon here, uh, there's a lot going on in our brains. And sometimes we can feel a bit scattered, uh, like those thoughts can get away from us once in a while. So tonight we're going to be exploring that, and we'll be offering some useful tools to help you take, uh, help your mind take control of your brain. So the first question we need to answer is, um, what is cognition? You know, what is it that we're going to be talking about this evening? Well, briefly, a definition is that cognition is higher level brain function. It's how we think about how and what we think and how we reflect on um, what we're doing and what we're thinking. It's how we use language, how we comprehend language, 
how we use our attention, how we sustain attention, how we focus, how we shift it, and how we multitask. Uh, cognition is also how we learn and remember new information, how we plan and perform complex tasks and put things together and organize them. It's also how we solve problems and monitor behavior. Um, cognition, of course, is a whole lot more than that, but this is a, a little nutshell definition of some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight as it relates to cognition. So here are some facts specifically about multiple sclerosis and cognition. Uh, first of all, 50 to 66 percent of people with MS will experience some cognitive changes over the course of the disease. Now for some people, they may be intermittent changes. And for others, um, it may be something that is just kind of a nagging challenge. Changes can occur at any time throughout the disease course. Sometimes, and with some people, it's even the first symptom of MS. Uh, but it is more common uh, the longer you've had the disease. Symptoms can range from mild to severe, but most of the symptoms um, Cognitive symptoms with MS really are mild to moderate, and they progress very slowly over time. One of the things I hear um, and am asked about a lot, uh, people with MS ask me, is they're afraid of you know, that A word, Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is cognitive issues with MS are not like the ones with Alzheimer's disease. Um, they range from mild to moderate. Um, they're fairly high level. Nevertheless, they really can be annoying and have a big effect on your life. Um, cognitive function physically correlates with the number of lesions and the lesion area on MRI, as well as with general brain atrophy. Um, however, you know, while there are lesions on the brain, sometimes it's really difficult to determine if there's a lesion in one spot of the brain, are you going to have specific symptoms? It's usually not that specific. So this is Some Julianne. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have a question for you, Janet. I have sure. heard that exacerbations can sometimes increase the risk of cognitive problems. Is that actually true? That is very true. And some of you listening may um, perhaps recall having real cognitive problems during an MS exacerbation that later resolved. So um, yeah, cognitive issues can be much worse, and language issues can be much worse during an exacerbation. Um, cognitive changes also progress slowly, um, but they usually don't improve dramatically once they've begun. Um, sometimes they will really get worse dramatically during an exacerbation and then improve at the, the end of an exacerbation. But um, once there are some cognitive changes, people normally notice that those cognitive changes tend to, to live with them for a while. And um, you just learn how to address things differently to get around them. All right. So are oh, there, there's oh, a sorry. lot to cognition. Um, <laughs> Are there any aspects of cognition that aren't affected? Well, as you can see in this slide here, um, <laughs> and I love putting this one in here because it is so true, what is not affected is general intelligence. Uh, people always say things like, oh, I used to be so smart and I'm not anymore. And I, I hope it helps to understand that IQ scores um, maybe changes in those scores, not that anyone's taking a lot of IQ tests, but any changes result more from um, sensory motor impairment and slower processing speed, essentially just processing things more slowly than you used to, um, than the inability to actually complete the tasks themselves. In other words, you can still do the tasks, it just takes you longer to do them. Um, and with regard to verbal skills, um, comprehension, the ability to repeat what is said, and confrontation naming and naming objects, that all remains intact. Um, basic attention is also unaffected. We'll be getting into a little more detail about types of attention and more complex attention. Certainly that can be affected in MS. 
So how are cognition and communication related? Um, and as a speech pathologist, I, I kind of want to provide this little bridge of what's, what's the bridge between cognition and communication. Um, and there is a connection. Um, speech gives voice to thoughts, obviously, and then cognitive processes are internalized and silent. So everything that's going on inside your head is going on inside your head. Language is the thing, whether it's spoken or written, that allows those thoughts and those cognitive processes to be shared. In multiple sclerosis, language impairment is often a reflection of cognitive changes. Um, a true aphasia, meaning a language impairment, often that you see with someone that has a, a stroke, um, or it's a real specific language impairment, is, is rare in MS. It can occur uh, sometimes, but it's usually associated with an acute exacerbation. So people may have issues with um, verbal expression in terms of word retrieval, and we are going to get to that a little bit later. But a true aphasia uh, is rare and language issues tend to be more a reflection of the cognitive challenges associated with MS. So as you can see from our little cartoon here, evolution has its downside, and now we have to organize our thoughts all the time. Instead of just letting them run around in our heads. Um, so I'd like all of you to think about what are your cognitive challenges. Think about those um, throughout this webinar and what can you do about them? And, and hopefully we can help you with answering that second question this evening. Um, so speaking of all of that, Julianne, um, and of organization, and what can you tell us, Julianne, about executive function? What is that exactly? Yeah. Well, executive function is an interesting um, aspect of our cognition. And I first want to say that we're going to talk a little bit about the executive function and, and a few other things, and then we're going to jump into the problem solving and tips that help make these things easier to take. Um, because a lot of the same sorts of tips apply to a multitude of different of the problems. So it's kind of an, an elegant way to address a lot of problems. So executive function. As you can see on the screen there, um, it, it comprises quite a few things. Um, planning and organization is one of them. Um, initiation. Initiation really is getting something started. So like cooking or getting, getting started on homework, um, getting started on paperwork. Um, I've sort of picked some things that might be onerous, but it doesn't have to be. It can be things that you enjoy. Initiation um, is just getting something started. Inhibition is pretty much the opposite of initiation. Inhibition means that we stop something from happening. So an example of that might be we're talking to someone and we're thinking one thing as we're listening to them, and maybe it would be a good idea if we didn't blurt out what we were thinking. Inhibition is that thing that steps in and keeps us from blurting out something like, you know, that's a really ugly tie or something like that. Working memory is just that. It's uh, our ability to hold in our mind and mentally manipulate information. Um, and it's for a short period of time. So it's like a desktop, if you will, like an old-fashioned desktop. Um, and an example of that would be doing mental arithmetic. You, you occupy your working mem memory with that, and then you move on. And you don't have to remember it, per se, um, unless you're in math class. And then other examples of that would be following short-term directions or, re or using it to write down a phone number or a PIN number in order for you to get it written down. And then you can move on and you don't have to remember it. It doesn't stay, it, doesn't, it stays for a short time and then it doesn't move on into short or long-term memory. And then cognitive flexibility is really the ability to change your mind. So, Apparently, what I, the old joke is that women are very good at using cognitive flexibility. And really, it's the ability to think of how you think about something, what you're thinking about, and maybe even what you think about something, you can change those things. And that is all cognitive flexibility. So what does executive function do for us, really? It allows us to communicate with ourselves and with others to be successful with our function in life. 
So some of the common problems that someone who might have some trouble with executive function might exhibit would be having trouble sequencing, organizing, or prioritizing. So let's say in a functional way that would be that maybe someone doesn't know whether they should start making dinner or work on their taxes. So there's probably going to be a priority there, but they may struggle with that decision. Um, not knowing how to tackle a task, especially if it's a big one. Say you have a closet that needs to be reorganized, and it really needs to be reorganized. Um, some, just getting, getting yourself started on it, that initiation, and, and, and then being able to know what to do with it is, is a hallmark of problems with executive function. Difficulty with time management is a common problem. And losing track of a topic in conversation can also be uh, a part of executive function problems. So in lieu of that, I'm going to pass it back to Janet, and she's going to talk about that tip of the tongue syndrome. Thanks, Julianne. Um, <laughs> this is something I hear people complain about a lot, including myself. And uh, considering what I do for a living, I often have these tip of the tongue moments myself. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about word retrieval or thinking of words. And some of the problems you might be having are feeling like that word is right on the tip of your tongue. You, you can almost see it, but you just can't come up with it at the right moment. Uh, um, people can get frustrated give up and withdraw from conversations as a result of this. And that's always something that I consider to be a little worrisome when something becomes that frustrating that you just kind of go, oh, forget it, and the conversation stops. Um, tripping up on words that are more specific, descriptive, or meaningful is very common when you're having difficulties with thinking of words or word retrieval. An example of that is one I've provided here. And it's coming up with the word locomotive versus train. You know, the word locomotive is so much more descriptive. That may be the word that you're trying to think of when you're speaking with somebody, but you just can't come up with it at the right moment. So sometimes you settle for the more common word of train. Um, and that can be one of the cognitive challenges of MS, specifically as it relates to verbal expression. But um, sometimes these deficits can also occur more often as we get older as well. And one of the reasons for that that's been offered by research is that the older we get, the larger our vocabularies are. And people that are a little bit older, and I count myself among them, um, have more specific words. They use more specific words in their vocabulary. So there's a nice spin on having that tip of the tongue moment. Um, if you find yourself talking around a word, that is called circumlocution, a wonderful word. It literally means talking around a word. And I'm going to show you that right here. Here's a little cartoon where the dinosaur is saying, hey, everybody look out. One of those, um, um, you know, uh, you know, that's the fire and stuff as the asteroid goes behind him. And at the bottom it says, despite its name, the thesaurus was quite often at a loss for words. Well, sometimes we too can often be at a loss for words. So the question is, what do we do about that? What are some tools and strategies we can use for word retrieval? Here are a few. And um, some people like to use some more than others, or you can incorporate all of these whenever you're having a problem. Number one is use gesture or pantomime. Um, it often cues the word if you're using your hands a lot. You can either cue yourself about the word or the person that is speaking with you might get the idea and provide the word for you. Uh, but it can also be used to communicate an idea without words. A significant part of communication, and it is well over half, of our communication with others is nonverbal. So this is a really important strategy. How we look, how we're using our hands, how we gesture can communicate volumes, especially if we're not able to verbally come up with the word. Another strategy is using writing or drawing. Um, that may be a self-cue strategy as well. 
where you start to perhaps draw with your finger on the table or the first letters with your finger on a piece of paper to cue yourself um, or maybe somebody else as to the word. Very often we can kind of think of what the first few letters are, maybe what it looks like. Another very common strategy to use, or actually two strategies, is find a synonym, a word that means something similar to the word that you're trying to come up with. Um, or you could use the opposite of that. You could use an antonym. Oh, you know it's not a, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this. And by the process of elimination, you could either, either cue yourself about the word or your listener can do so for you. The whole point of this is to keep the lines of communication open during a conversation so you don't give up and you're not withdrawing and just saying, oh, forget it, we'll talk about it later. Talking around the word, essentially using circumlocution, um, is really useful. It's a really useful tool. You can describe the attributes of something you're thinking about. You can describe its function. Oh, you know that thing you cut with. That thing you cut with and it, it's big and um, I use it to cut my onions and when you can't come up with the word knife or something more specific, you can describe it. You can describe what it looks like, what it's used for. Uh, the first letter of a word, I think all of us have tried to use that as well as a strategy and that's also effective. It starts with an S, it starts with an L, or it has T-I-O-N at the end. Usually we can't think of the word itself, but you can think of some part of the word. And expressing even that can be helpful in coming up with the word or helping your listener to help you. Another good strategy to use is think of the word category. Uh, for example, it's an African animal. It's the African animal that has the mane on it. You know, big teeth. They're in pride. Oh, it's a lion. Narrowing something down to a category narrows the number of choices you have and makes it far easier to retrieve the word that you're trying to think of. I want to reiterate that you actually are not forgetting the word. It's just having trouble retrieving the word that is stored, already stored in your brain and you're having trouble pulling it out. Some of the other issues that you may be having might have to do with um, comprehension and processing of what people are saying and verbal information. Um, for example, listening and paying attention. So you may feel like one of my favorite expressions, I'm a day late and a dollar short, like you're just a step behind in a conversation and not able to keep up with it because it feels like it's coming too fast and the information is coming at you from too many directions. This can often happen when you're at a party, when there are a lot of people talking, and you're trying to follow bits and pieces of multiple conversations at one time, and you can get completely overloaded. Um, and you can feel like it's just coming too fast, and after a while, your brain checks out, and you just feel like you can't follow it anymore. It may be feeling also like comprehension or a response is coming too late. Um, and this isn't the sort of thing that occurs like when you're really angry and you, know, you think of what you'd like to say to that person at 3 a.m. in the morning. It's really when you're in a more functional conversation with the person, say, with your boss, and you can't really come up with the response to a question being asked of you or you can't think of the question that you want to ask until the conversation is already a few sentences down the road. Um, having trouble keeping up and responding quickly. Having trouble with tasks that have time constraints. That could be a big attention issue as well. And uh, one thing I'm sure many of you uh, feel is that you can't multitask anymore. That may be something you used to be able to do, and that's just not something that you feel very adept at. So let's look at some strategies for addressing some of those attention and processing issues. One I really like to teach people about is called repeat and verify. That's the first bullet point on this. Um, in conversation, what you want to do is you want to repeat 
in a very casual way what the person speaking to you just said. For example, if it's a, um, you know, a, a friend saying, well, why don't we go to dinner next Thursday at 6? You repeat saying, oh, so you want to go to dinner next Thursday at 6. That does a few things. It verifies that what you heard is correct. If you repeat it and you say, dinner next Thursday at 8, your friend will say, no, 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 I said 6. So you can verify that what you heard was actually what that person said. It allows you to hear it again because essentially that statement has been said twice and so you're hearing it again. It gives your, your brain you know, another go at it and it buys you time. It allows you to compensate for that slower processing speed. It's also a strategy that people really don't notice in conversation. It's not like people will go, oh my gosh, they're using a cognition strategy. It's really active listening, and it's very flattering to a listener as well. So I encourage you to, to try this out once in a while if you feel like you're having trouble keeping up with conversations and what people are saying to you. Just repeat the last part of what somebody said, and it kind of keeps it going and slows the conversation down to your pace. Another very, very concrete strategy is using email and text messages. So many of us now with smartphones and computers are using these. It's second nature. Um, those actually, as much as we complain about technology, can be very helpful uh, because they provide records of conversations and information that can be referred to again and again. I will go back over previous text message conversations I've had with somebody and go, what did they say about that? When did they want me to come and fill in for them? And I will go back and look at that and verify again. So really using email and text messages and anything written as a way to process and to attend uh, is also very helpful. Same thing goes with voicemail and answering machines. Um, although I think with most of us now it's voicemail, especially if we have smartphones. And it allows you to save the message and then to hear it again. So while email and text messages offer um, a written record of information, a voicemail allows you to actually hear something again and save those things and replay them as many times as you would like. Um, so Julianne, um, what are some of the other things that, that we can do for attention and processing? Absolutely. There's all kinds of really good um, things that you probably have heard quite a bit about them, but we're going to talk about them in specific and how they can be a, uh, a little bit helpful. So that old adage, do one thing at a time. Um, if something is really important, that's the best way to get through something and to, and to do it very well. So in other words, minimize multitasking. And I have news for all of us. Um, research has actually proven that our brains don't multitask very well. So um, we may think that we're doing pretty good, and certainly millennials are really quite good at doing it, or at least they appear to be. But I don't know if any of the rest of you have teenage children, but if I really want my son to remember something that I'm telling him, I have to have him stop playing the video game to make sure that he gets what it is that I really want him to get. So if multitasking or if, if focusing your attention or processing is somewhat challenging, then slowing things down to one at a time will make a, a really nice difference for you um, and, and feels much better. The other thing is minimizing background noise. Now, I've noticed that as I have gotten older in life, that if I am going or driving to an unfamiliar place, I cannot have the radio on. It's, I, it, I would completely melt down. I, I get lost. It, it's just crazy. So if I'm following directions on my phone or if somebody's in the car with me and they're telling me turn left, turn right, go there, the, then I cannot, I cannot have background noise. So that's one of the first things to do. And, and you can turn off the radio in the car if you're at a, at a place where you can't multitask. Um, you can ask your family member to watch TV in a different room or close the door. Um, just go ahead and make the environment more friendly. 
for you to to work and and play in. The other thing, and uh, there was a webinar in January that we talked about about organization, and organizing can make a big difference in making up for any challenges that we might be facing, um, whether that's inattention or problems with initiation or problems with sequencing, having um, your space really organized is really helpful. And I would say take a look at the, um, the desk on the left-hand side. And I would put forth that just about anybody would have trouble sitting down to work at this desk. And we would all pick going to the desk on the right. But if you have any kinds of challenges, Having a desk that looks like that is going to make it even more frustrating and even, even more difficult. So setting up your environment so that you have success is really helpful. And there's one other thing I would say. When I'm meeting people for the first time, this kind of harks back to something that, that Janet was talking about, about repeating information. Um, it's a really effective strategy. And when I meet somebody for the first time, their name will go right in one ear and out the other. And so I will just say to them, tell me your name again because if I hear it the second time, I'll get it. And I always do because I've, set, I've kind of set my cognition. I'm really focused on them. I'm really focused on their name, and I'm getting some repetition. So it's, um, it's really helpful, and people do like to hear you repeat back what they've said. So with that in mind, um, I will sometimes walk into a room and completely forget why I am there. So Janet, is that worrisome? Is that something I should be concerned about? I think that's something that all of us do. Um, at least <laughs> I'd like to think so because I do that with some regularity myself. Um, let's talk a little bit about memory because that is related to memory, but walking into a room and forgetting why you're there is also related to attention and perhaps not being present and attending to what you're doing in the moment as well. Um, some of the problems that you may be experiencing with memory uh, might involve having trouble learning or recalling new information. It may feel like you're listening to something or reading something over and over and over again, and it just doesn't really feel like it's getting in there. Um, misplacing things, that is something that is, is very common, losing your car keys, losing... Um, well, in my case, my name badge for work. That's something I do as well, and, and that gets very frustrating because it can add to uh, the time we spend and we feel like we're spinning our wheels. Forgetting conversations or dialogue. Sometimes it's forgetting the content of the conversations or dialogue, and sometimes it does involve forgetting that you even had that conversation. Uh, in the first place, especially if it was, you know, a week or two ago. Forgetting appointments. Forgetting appointments actually involves a type of memory called perspective memory, and that's remembering something in the future. Remembering to remember something in the future. And forgetting why you entered a room. So those might be some of the, the problems you may be experiencing with memory. Um, when talking about memory strategies, I don't want to go into too much detail about very specific strategies because those strategies can be about, about as specific as the individual themselves. Um, and also a lot, as Julianne said before, a lot of what we're offering tonight as far as strategies actually help across the spectrum with cognitive areas. And so helping your executive function and getting more organized actually does help your memory. But one strategy to use to help your memory is combine all of your senses. So if it's something that you're hearing, you want to try to see it, you want to write it, you want to hear it again by repeating it and do it. You want to try to combine all five of your senses, or if you can't combine all five, at least add another one to it. So if somebody's speaking to you, you say, let me write this down. The very act of writing that will help you to store it and to remember it later. Then reading it back to yourself and reading it is another way visually of 
really solidifying that that gets stored in your brain to be remembered later. You're less likely to forget it. But perhaps one of the most important points I can make about memory, especially as it relates to MS, I think, is that impaired attention and slowed processing play a huge role. In other words, you cannot remember something that you were unable to attend to or process in the first, first place. It will never get in your brain to be stored and remembered. So that's why attention and processing and strategies to help those will make a really big difference in your memory. So general cognitive strategies yield big benefits for memory, especially those that I just mentioned, as well as some executive functioning strategies. But remember that compensation is the key. Many memory problems can be solved with better organization. So Janet, in terms of memory, I have heard that using sticky notes is a good idea for helping you remember stuff. What do you think about that? Okay, sticky notes. Um, let's get on to sticky notes. This is what I think of sticky notes, or otherwise known as post-its. They are bad strategies. Um, I don't dismiss them out of hand, but usually the way people use sticky notes is they post them everywhere in many different places. And essentially what that does is it makes your brain and your thinking much more scattered than it already is. So. As you can see, the woman from coming out of the memory seminar, she's covered with them. That is not an effective strategy. And then on the second cartoon here, this is a classic case of forgetting where you put something. Where did you put the sticky note? It's very often you write it down, you stick it somewhere, and then you forget where it was. And in this case, the man forgot where he put the sticky note, reminding him to buy more sticky notes. So if you use sticky notes, write on them to keep them all in one place. And if you don't have to use them at all, that's even better. <laughs> so just to tell our listening some... audience, <laughs> um, Janet is legendary for, for disliking sticky notes. And, that's what <laughs> and it was one of the things that I learned early on in working with her is that <laughs> recommending, them, <laughs> recommending them is not a good idea. And then when she described as the, the reason why, I'm like, oh, that makes perfectly good sense. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Julianne, yes, someone actually at the program did give me um, a birthday card about <laughs> sticky notes about 10 years ago. So yeah, it is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So what are some strategies we can use, Julianne? All right. Well, I'd be happy to take that on. Um, strategies for success, success. I think um, there's a ubiquitous saying out there now, now called, everything has its place. And I probably should have put that all in capital letters. Um, and that, so that eliminates that you know, moving like a tornado through your home when you're trying to get out the door to school or to work. And what, where did I put my keys, and where is my purse, and where did all my sunglasses, and, you know, if we have things all in a place where they are supposed to live, then that eliminates that, and of course that eliminates the stress and the frazzle that, that, that shifts us off of our focus and our attention, which makes everything feel worse if we're, if we're rushing around and trying to find things. So make, make time to organize things so that your mail, the bills that come in the mail, your keys, your phones, wallets, purses, shopping lists, shoes, things, jackets, things that you need when you go out the door um, are all in one place and they're easy to find. And then using scheduling tools. Um, I have a few people that come to see me who still use um, a paper and pencil calendar and it works great for them. And so what I encourage people to do is do use a system that works very nicely for you. Smartphones are wonderful for this. And if you are a person who has a smartphone but you're reluctant to use it or you don't feel very comfortable using it, carving out some time to learn how to use it can really make your life a lot easier. Um, that said, it doesn't keep you from forgetting appointments because I am guilty of said thing. Um, but it can make a big difference because they're so mobile and go everywhere with you. 
If you are like me and uh, have a busy family life and multiple people living in your home, um, having a central calendar can make a big difference. So how you plan your day can, can, can be influenced by how your, your partner lives and what they're doing and what your children are up to doing, what your parents are up to doing. So um, having a central calendar, whether that's a Google calendar or whether that's a calendar on the wall, can really be helpful. And then using a whiteboard or a chalkboard, if, if you want, for instant messages, using text, of course, can be helpful. Um, in, in uh, disseminating information if things are changing on the fly. So um, that said, I would say that um, last week uh, my schedule changed unexpectedly. And I had something scheduled for later in the day, and um, I completely spaced the, the appointment because my schedule had changed unexpectedly. And so I just you know, wandered off and started doing my own thing in the afternoon without going back and consulting on my calendar. So often it's a good idea, especially if you have a sudden change in your schedule, to go back and look at your calendar just to jog your memory and make sure that that tool is working for you. So if you find that you're overwhelmed, here are some tips for helping decrease the overwhelm. Especially if you're taking on a task that is uh, a big task, one of those big things, cleaning out the closet or starting your taxes or something like that, put a time limit on the task. Because it's very, very easy. I think we've all just gone down the rabbit hole of, oh my gosh, it's been an hour and a half and I don't have much to show for it. And that's very frustrating. So if you set a timer and you put dedicate 5 to 20 minutes on that task. You can mow through a fair amount of it and then move on with your day and not feel like you're being dragged down. We've talked a little bit about noise, but other distractions can get in the way too. So eliminating, if, if say your, your, uh, the rest of your family is watching a, a movie in the other room and you're trying to put together a presentation, say, um, you might ask them or you might move to another location where it's not distracting you all the time. You can put in a little bit of time each day or week for an overwhelming task. So taking that time limit and maybe putting five minutes or ten minutes each day on cleaning out the closet um, can, can help you uh, whittle down a task that seems um, too big. And then choosing the most important part of a task to be done and doing that first. So my son is great at that with his homework. He usually tells me, I did the worst part of my homework first, and so now I can kind of relax a little bit. Um, that's part of prioritization. That's part of executive function. And if you can get good at doing that, then you know that you're getting the most important part done first, and that takes some of the stress out of doing tasks. So I love this with the refrigerator. This is our home's communication center. <laughs> And indeed, what, where do you even start with something like that? So if that's your system, um, then that's outdated, and you want to try to clean up that system. And then the gal, <laughs> hey, I found my to-do list. <laughs> I've been looking for that for a while. <laughs> Julianne, I would just buy a new yeah. refrigerator. <laughs> no kidding. Just out with that one. <laughs> It needs a water dispenser in it anyway. <laughs> so this brings us to a concept called pacing. And I think pacing is probably one of the most important things for us to learn, and it's also one of the most challenging. And if you've ever spent much time around an occupational therapist, you will know that we are fond of using this, this phrase, phraseology for pacing for fatigue management. But it's also true when we're talking about managing cognitive symptoms as well because we know that being taxed cognitively can also lead to fatigue. There's such a thing as cognitive, cognitive fatigue as well. Um, so pacing, I like to think in terms of the marathon. We want to be able to finish the race and we want to be able to have the energy to, be, to remain standing when we go across the finish line. So in order to do that, again, if you spent time around an occupational therapist, we talk about budgeting and banking energy. And that means you put restoration breaks in throughout the course of the day. So you don't get all the way to the end of the day and then take a rest break. 
Um, although if that's a strategy that works, then you keep it. But you want to have a break mid-morning and at noon and mid-afternoon and, and really whenever you need it. <clears throat> Restoration breaks can be mental, physical, or both. And they allow you to build energy. They allow you to de-stress. They allow you to reevaluate. If you're frustrated and things aren't going well, you get a chance to take a step back and go, so what could I change here that would make this better? The other part of this is aiming for a consistent energy requirement uh, to eliminate big ups and downs. Big ups and downs, like, like you have a big monster day and then the very next day you don't do anything at all, um, both cognitively and physically, can confuse our body. And so striving to have a more consistent um, need for what, you, for what you need to do can really help manage both fatigue and cognitive fatigue and cognitive uh, use. When you take pacing skills and put them hand in hand with prioritization, they can be a really, really powerful tool um, to helping you feel like you've mastered or compensated well for a problem. Now that brings me to exercise. And the more we learn about exercise, the more stunned I am about how amazing it is. And it, it's really the magic pill. We just can't take it like one. Um, but research now is finding that, that exercise boosts neuroprotective qualities in your brain. And I think that's just stunning, especially when you have um, an immune system overreaction that is attacking its own cells. Having something that provides a neuroprotective boost is really helpful. And then, of course, exercise does so many more things. It boosts our mood. It helps the circulatory system. It, it gooses the lymph system. It, it improves our muscle tone and our skin. It's, it's good for tissue regeneration. And In fact, there is some research that says that people who exercise actually look younger than people who don't. So, hey, why not? So the next thing to talk about in general terms is stress management. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Um, I think that we could probably do an entire webinar on stress management, so we aren't going to spend a whole lot of time on it here today. But how you deal with stress really does matter to your brain and your body. And here are just some general, general thoughts about that. But Avoiding rushing is a big part of, of, of managing stress. Planning ahead, communication is a huge part of, of managing stress. Um, exercise, as we mentioned, organizing, and then breathing deeply or meditating. Um, has, again, research has proven that it is a really effective tool. And what it does is it brings our body out of the fight or flight stress reaction and into uh, a calmer place, so it actually changes our physiology. And living in the moment is really avoiding multitasking and paying attention to what's going on right in front of you. So one last thing to say before we move on to another, another part of our topic, play up your strengths. Knowing what you do well and then and spinning off your strategies from that can really be helpful to you. Um, so knowing who you are, if you are already pretty good at organizing and you're still having some trouble with memory, add, knowing that you don't have to worry about organization, you can start focusing in on other strategies like the repetition strategies or, or things like that can be really helpful. So you're not reinventing the wheel. Knowing what your strengths are help you narrow your focus so you can really hone in on what you need to do. So the next part I'm going to hand over to Janet. Once I get the slide to come up, there we go. And right. the most difficult thing, I think, is when to get help. Thank you, Julianne. Um, you know, I love that last slide you had to uh, emphasize your strengths, play up your strengths. Because I think that when you have challenges like this, um, naturally, it's part of human nature to overemphasize the negative. And there have been studies that have shown that when one person gets one negative comment, it takes eight positive ones to undo the negative comment. We seem to be kind of hardwired to focus on the negative. And I think that also um, applies 
when you have difficulties with cognition. Um, so the whole point is to try to move from that deficit-based model to a strength-based one. There are a lot of things that you may not be able to do or things that you can't do as well, but focusing on what you can do can, can kind of reset how your perspective on all of this. But when you do really need to get help, if your problems are affecting you and how you function daily, um, if you have difficulty finding the right words regularly, that communication becomes a really big issue and you're not communicating, able to communicate well anymore. If you have trouble remembering what to do on the job or doing daily routines at home, particularly if it relates to safety. Um, if you have difficulty making decisions or you're showing poor judgment, and if sometimes that's even shocking to you, it's like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? I don't know why I did that. Uh, trouble keeping up with tasks or conversations. Even the mild symptoms can have a big impact on your ADLs or activities of daily living. Um, and you, know, you may not know that people with MS leave the workforce more because of cognitive and fatigue issues than they do for mobility issues. And there are a lot of things that can be done specifically if you're starting to have some real issues with your daily function, that's when it's time to get help. If it's really affecting your work, if it's affecting your safety at home, if it's affecting your family um, in a way that you really don't think you can handle on your own, it is time to get help. So let me move on to how you may get help. Okay, the first thing you would want to do is you would want to speak to your doctor about your concerns because any time you might need a referral to um, a speech pathologist, an occupational therapist, a neuropsychologist, you would need somebody managing that care and that would be your physician first. So that would be your first step. And the next thing you'd want to think about is think about what problems you're having in terms of function. Very often people will say, I'm having trouble with my memory. I can't remember anymore. Well, think of it in terms of what functions are affected by that. For example, um, do you forget conversations? Do you forget appointments? Do you forget words? When you describe your issues that way in terms of function, it helps your physician and it really helps the professionals that you're working with to pinpoint what they want to assess and what they want to target. Because when I hear things like that, oh, you're for, I'm forgetting words, I'm forgetting appointments, I think, oh, I'm going to really look into prospective memory with this person. I'm going to look into word retrieval. So thinking of it in terms of function and how that plays out in your daily life is really helpful. And Julianne did bring up stress uh, can have a big effect on cognition. The other thing uh, that is quite common with MS is depression. And depression research shows over and over and over again, both with MS and with people that don't have MS, depression has a significant effect on cognition. It can really uh, very often make somebody more cognitively impaired and can mimic cognitive impairment. So treating your mental health can improve your physical health and your cognitive health as well. And it is kind of a cycle because your perception of your cognitive impairment, that negative self-talk, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't remember anymore, I'm just so, you know, I used to be so smart and I'm not smart anymore, then that makes you more depressed. And then as you get more depressed, your cognition can become more impaired and one affects the other. So you can then see how that cycle can get worse and worse. So addressing depression, if it's something you've been diagnosed with or you already think that may be an issue, I would really recommend that you talk to your physician about dealing with that. Um, we did do a webinar in July of 2012 on cognition and um, mental health and depression and I did it with a, a clinical psychologist. And it was for it was a webinar for Can Do MS, and that may be archived, and that might be something to listen to as well. Okay, so going on how to get help, um, you want to make sure that you go to a professional that 
evaluates cognitive dysfunction. So for example, a speech language pathologist like myself, um, you, the best thing would be to go to someone like me or somebody that deals with um, neurological issues versus a speech pathologist that works in a school. Um, and the same goes for um, seeing an occupational therapist. And you know, they work in many different areas as well. So you really want to see a professional that specializes in this sort of thing. Um, or see a, a neuropsychologist, especially if you're having issues that may involve um, thinking about going on disability at work. You're going to need a neuropsychological evaluation. So a careful assessment will determine your individual challenges. But the other thing too, and I know from doing these assessments, it also really identifies your strengths. What can you do? Because as Julianne said, really working on those can have a beneficial effect on the areas of impairment as well. So that early recognition and assessment um, can make a big difference because cognitive changes can really affect your livelihood and it definitely can affect your relationships as well. Um, people can misinterpret uh, cognitive impairment, forgetting appointments as, oh gee, you just don't care enough to remember it, when it really is a problem with your cognition. Very true. So, so yeah. Janet, I've heard a lot about um, brain stimulating programs that are out there. Um, are they are they worth it? Is it is it a good idea to to stimulate your cognition by by playing those games? Um, so brain games. Um, I get a lot of questions about brain games, and my first response to that really is: if you love them, then do them because the best thing for your brain and cognition is doing something you love. But let me give you a quote about that kind of sums up the recent research over the last couple of years about a lot of those brain fitness programs. Um, there's little evidence that playing brain games improves underlying broad cognitive abilities or that it enables one to better navigate a complex realm of everyday life. And that was a joint statement from the Stanford Center for Longevity and the Max Planck Institute of Human Development last October, October of 2014. And as you can see by this illustration here, the man says, brain training has done wonders for my memory. However, he's forgotten to put on his pants. So the point I'm trying to make with this is um, that when you're using a lot of those brain fitness programs, and some of them can be pretty costly actually, um, there, you often get very good at doing those brain fitness programs. And you will see a big change from when you started doing certain tasks on those programs to when you end. Um, the problem is, is they don't generalize to daily function. And that's been proven time and again through studies. So I just want to reiterate that if you really enjoy doing them, doing something you love is one of the best things you can do for your brain. But if you feel like it's something that you need to do because you're having cognitive problems and you should do it, um, maybe you want to think twice about that. Because um, really, there are some things instead of the brain fitness programs that you can do. What does help? Once again, exercise. Research has proven its benefit on cognition throughout the lifespan. That is throughout the life, including to the most elderly. It's good for your body. It's good for your brain. Like Julianne said, it is like a magic pill. It affects everything. Another thing that really helps is social interaction, time spent with family and friends, time spent interacting with other human beings, being part of a group, being part of, you know, if you go to church, going to church services and interacting with those people, that is a great way to keep your brain healthy and help to keep you sharp. Learning something new. Is, and I, I listed a few things here, but we could go on forever about all the new things you could learn. Once again, I want to emphasize, if it's something that you really enjoy doing, then learning something new is the best thing you can do if it's something you like. So an example is learning a new language. 
I have a new little obsession. It's the Duolingo app on my iPhone. You can, and they have, I don't know, they just added I don't know how many new languages. It's very interactive. It's not something where you're just pushing buttons or you're listening. You're actually speaking into it, and it keeps taking you from reading, listening, saying, through all of your senses. And it's a great way to just learn the basics of a new language, and it's fun. So if that's something you're interested in, something like that would be a good idea, or to take a class. Music and art are good for the brain, again, throughout the lifespan. You don't have to be playing music or painting. You can be listening to it. Going to concerts, becoming a connoisseur of art is good. Um, the other thing I've heard that for people who have not played an instrument, one of the biggest things right now is playing the ukulele. There are a lot of people that have started ukulele groups, and I guess that's something you can learn rather quickly. And so that's certainly on my list of things to do. Joining a book club combines reading with social interaction. And if you enjoy reading books, then getting involved with people where you can discuss them is, uh, is really helpful and sounds like a lot of fun. Crafts and hobbies, the only caveat to that is you don't want them to be too isolating. So if you're in a workshop building birdhouses, you don't want to isolate yourself doing that for 12 hours a day and not communicating with anybody else. Then it's counterproductive. But otherwise, things like you know, quilting and any hobbies you really enjoy are a wonderful way and a more integrative way to keep your brain healthy. And you'll notice here that I listed interactive integrated video games, which you know, Julianne is not going to want her son to hear. And I don't want any of my sons to hear either. Um, but certain video games that are integrated, meaning where you have to do multiple things and build a system and interact in multiple ways, research has proven that if you like doing that sort of thing, actually, it's good for you. And it helps your cognition. A Florida State study in August of last year showed that cognitive gains were found after eight hours of video gaming on an integrative video game task. I'm not talking Angry Birds. Um, compared with no gains from eight hours of Lumosity. So, and there was also another study uh, several years ago about people who are elderly, and there was a video game called, I believe it was called Rise of Nations. It was like one of those Sims games where you created civilizations. And um, people did far better cognitively and functionally after playing those games because they were integrative and it, it encompassed a multitude of cognitive tasks. But the thing I want to emphasize most of all is do something you enjoy doing. So um, if you love to you know, sew, then continue doing something like that and uh, make sure that you're interacting with people on a regular basis. If you love doing brain games, by all means do them. But if you don't love doing it, don't sit down and go, okay, I've got to go through this now, because it will actually be quite counterproductive. So a few tips to remember. Um, first of all, keep yourself active and stimulated, one of the best things you can do. Also remember that while testable abilities, what is assessed on a test may not improve, function can definitely be enhanced, meaning that your functional abilities and how you manage to function day to day, um, that will be improved by using a lot of these general strategies that we've discussed this evening. Also remember that the journey is just as important as the destination. Just doing something and trying to do something and taking one step of changing how you do something to maybe make your attention a little better is the right step. It's the journey. So it's practice and not perfection. Give yourself permission to do things a little differently than you did them before. And I know this is also you know, a process and not an event because we get used to accomplishing certain tasks in a certain way. And then when we start having problems, we kind of get tied up in, but I always used to do it this way. 
give yourself permission to do it a different way. There are a lot of different ways to get to the same destination. So you know, give yourself permission to do things just a little differently than you did them before. Try them out and see what works for you. So remember to concentrate on your strengths. Move from that deficit-based model to a strength-based model. Less what, this is what I can't do, to these are the things I can do. And remember to stay focused on what you can do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Janet. It was uh, a lot of good information um, about cognition. And now we want to thank all of you for um, joining us tonight for this conversation. We're going to open the floor to questions and comments. And I've been reading through some of the ones that you've been putting on here. So great information. And some of you are doing some awesome things for yourself. And I'm going to turn it over to Anne at this point, and she'll take some of the questions. Awesome. Thanks, Julian and Janet. Um, great tips tonight, stuff that I myself can <laughs> apply to my own um, uh, brain fog and my own issues in my daily life. Um, we did get a few questions about our slides tonight, so I do want to just address that up front. Um, you, people that are on this webinar tonight, you will be uh, emailed and sent copies of tonight's slides right after the webinar. So um, if you can just hold tight and wait for those slides to get to you, and you'll be able to review them um, in your own time. Um, so we did get a lot of questions, um, and we had a few people ask um, this. Um, people are wondering how they can communicate with their friends and family what's actually going on with their cognitive issues um, and to help them understand that they're not trying to manipulate their friends or that they're not you know, actually stupid or uncaring, but this is actually a cognition issue. Do you guys have any tips of how they can communicate that? Um, well, I'll, I'll address that that briefly. Um, my first um, tip would be kind of ask yourself how much you want to communicate that. Um, remember that if, if you think that friends and family are misinterpreting your, your cognitive challenges, um, they may not understand that is going on unless you actually tell them it's going on. So you have to do a little self-assessment on how comfortable you are sharing that and saying, you know, I'm really having some issues with paying attention. I, I know it's important. You're very important to me, but I'm really having some trouble, and that's very common in MS. Perhaps some of the facts that we gave you tonight will help some of some people around you to understand that this is a pretty common problem with multiple sclerosis, and that may be the first step. Um, people do often misinterpret something as being manipulative or forgetful or uncaring, and really educating them generally about the symptoms of cognition with MS or more specifically about your symptoms is pretty important about helping them to understand you better and get a different perspective on that. And then I would also urge you that if it is a really significant communication issue and it's really affecting your relationships, I would then you know, consult a therapist about addressing that more specifically. Great. Thanks, Janet. Uh, so we had another uh, participant. They asked, um, um, they want, they're interested in learning how to differentiate between whether what they're experiencing is MS-related cognitive issues or is it that they're just getting older? Is there a way to differentiate between the two? Julianne, do you want me or do you want, you want to take that? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say something very briefly, but that's more probably more of a, a Janet question. Um, I, I'm not... In terms of function, as an occupational therapist, I, um, I would say if things are getting in the way of how you perform the things you want to do, then compensating for it, no matter what the reason, is a good idea. So you don't want this thing to bother you. You don't want memory or focusing or, or difficult problems with multitasking to get in your way. So go ahead and compensate for that. If you really want to know, um, is this MS or is it something else, you, can, you could... Uh, sit down with a speech language pathologist and go through some testing um, or uh, but I'm going to actually punt that back to Janet for the for the rest of the answer. <laughs> well, well, pretty much that's what I was going to answer. If if you really want to know where it's coming from, 
going in for an assessment would be a good idea. But generally, um, is knowing the cause of it or the source of it more important than actually figuring out how to address it no matter what the cause is? And I would say too that as we get older, it gets harder and harder to tease out specifically what is contributing to what. So it may be a little bit of both. It may be MS and it may be getting older. So you may also not be satisfied with the answer because it won't be real clear. Um, but what Julianne said is really important. You're focusing on compensating and if it's getting in the way, can you get around it? Can you help yourself become more functional? That's the most important thing, whether it's age-related or MS-related. Awesome. Great. Um, let's see here. Just looking through all the questions. Okay. So uh, someone asks, uh, do we know why tip of the tongue actually happens? Do we know what's happening in the brain? to call? Well, tip of the tongue, um, we could get into the language centers of the brain, uh, but that's really not the big issue uh, with MS-related tip of the tongue and word retrieval problems. Usually it's uh, slower processing that is um, creating that tip of the tongue moment more with MS. And you know our language centers are on the left side of our brain, and so yes, you can say more specifically that may be the reason for it. Um, but there's really not a specific brain area that's going to give you the tip of the tongue um, feeling and frustration, as opposed to someone who has a stroke in a specific area of the brain and their language deficits and word retrieval deficits are very, very specific. Then you can pinpoint it and predict it. With MS, it's a bit more general. And people with MS tend to um, cluster around complaining about similar cognitive symptoms. And they tend to be processing speed, attention, memory, and word retrieval being a big one. And one relates to the other. So it, it really is kind of that processing and slower processing that creates that tip of the tongue feeling and not a specific lesion on a specific spot in the brain. Um, and I, I'm so sorry, we do have so many more questions, but I, we are running out of time, and so I did want to um, move on and, and finish the webinar. But you know, if you did have a question, we do have a resource called Ask the Can Do Team. Um, if you go to our website at mscando.org and look for Ask the Can Do Team page, you can type in your question specifically, um, your specific question into that form, and. Uh, we will address it to either Janet or Julianne or to any one of our many programs consultants to answer directly to you. So again, I apologize that we weren't able to um, address all of the questions here, um, but hopefully we, um, we can provide another resource for you to get those questions answered. Um, you can you know, go to our website for even more resources. Um, we have what's called e-news, and I think a lot of you are already receiving those emails of um, once a month e-blasts giving you, um, you know, up-to-date information about our programs and events that are happening. And we also have a can-do library, uh, which is accessible on our website. And those are just short library articles about all sorts of different topics um, that might be affecting your, your daily life with MS. Um, so please remember to check those out and take advantage um, of those. Um, our next webinar is going to be on June 9th, and the topic is Accessing Your MS Community. It's all about fitness, recreation, and adaptive sports. And we have a physical therapist as well as an exercise physiologist that will be um, leading this um, program, so we encourage you to join us again uh, for this exciting webinar. Um, and again, everyone will be receiving a copy of tonight's slides, um, and also as soon as the webinar uh, is, uh, is over, you'll receive um, a link to complete a survey. So I encourage you to please complete this short survey and your feedback really helps us to improve our webinars. Um, and again, thank you so much, Janet and Julian, for all of your helpful tips and for your knowledge on you know, how we can keep our cognition up. And we appreciate everyone um, joining us this evening. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Thanks.